major university and can offer four-year degrees. Plus, we're also approved to work directly with VA students. Okay, so a degree in what and what's a VA student? Well, it's a bachelor's degree in aeronautics, which includes a commercial pilot's license, and there's financial aid available. By VA students, I mean veterans. They now have access to new benefits to pay for flight training. Okay, so you have new opportunities for new students. What about the instructor side of it? Well, with new students, we need more instructors. Oh, well, yeah, that makes sense. So, if anyone out there is a flight instructor, I want to encourage them to come see me. And if they're not an instructor but have their commercial license, we can help them become an instructor. So they get their instructor license and have a job too. Exactly. So you got a lot going on. The VA, the college, and now hiring instructors and future instructors too. Yep. So now can we get the commercial started? Already ahead of you. Call Brad to get your adventure started today at Ocala Aviation. 861-7484. Ocala's Information Station. 1370 WOCA. Ocala! Uh, three minutes before 11 o'clock. I was going through an art show, Robin, down in Palm Beach. Gosh, this was a, a long time ago. And, uh, you know, the, the typical thing you would see in an art show, you see paintings of flowers and, and paintings of landscapes and, uh, you know, some uh, some other de- detailed work, maybe portraits, uh, you know, of famous people or something like that. And there was one artist who had... Um, what looked to be famous paintings, not that I'm a painting uh, expert in any way, but you know, you recognize them, like the Mona Lisa and, and things by Rembrandt and, and uh, yeah. Vincent van Gogh, etc. Uh, and he, he didn't consider them forgeries, he considered them, I, th- I think he said replicas or something like that. And I, I thought, wow, is that, is that something you can do? Is that legal? <laughs> Are you allowed to <laughs> do that? Uh, it does, doesn't John Travolta have a movie out with f- f- called Forge or something like Forgery? Something, something like, like that. that. I don't know. Uh, Noah Charney is on the phone, and he's... N- where is he? Overseas, Robin? Yes. He is a professor. He's an author of fiction and nonfiction. He specializes in the fields of art, history, and art crime. I wonder if the guy I saw in Palm Beach was criminal. He's the founder and president of the Association for Research into Crimes Against Art. He appeared on BBC, the BBC, ITV, CNBC, MSNBC, and he's been featured in a bunch of publications, including the New York Times Magazine, uh, El Pace, how you say it, Pay? Pay. Uh, Vogue, Vanity Fair, Playboy, my favorite, Elle, and, <laughs> and Tattler. His book is called The Art of Forgery, The Minds, Motives, and Methods of Master Forgers. It's a very, very fascinating book. Noah Charney, good morning, Noah. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Where are you? Where are you calling from? Believe it or not, I live in Slovenia. I bet I'm your first guest from Slovenia. Is that right? I think you are. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for calling in. I got to look up Slovenia now. I'm not even <laughs> sure where it is. Where is Slovenia? Yeah, frantically Google it, yeah. Um, it's in Central Europe. If you can imagine where Venice is, it's just a little bit to the right and just south of Vienna. Oh, okay, okay. That sort of gives me an idea. Wow, and and, and you have you speak so perfect English. I mean, are you from America? Where are you from? Yeah, I'm from the exotic city of New Haven, Connecticut. I'm married <laughs> to Slovene, and so I wound up settling down over here. And I I teach here, and I teach in Rome. So I'm I'm an expat, but um, first first to let's see, 18 years of life all in the U.S. So that's why I do speak quite good English. So let let me ask you about this topic. If I create a painting of an already existing painting, but I never tell anybody it is that painting. Am I breaking the law? No, no, the, I'll have no need to arrest you, Larry. That's perfectly legal. And in <laughs> fact, that's the way that the majority of artists have always learned how to work. Artists throughout history and even today usually work in a studio system where there'll be a master of famous artists, whether it's Rubens or Rembrandt or these days Jeff Koons or Damien Hirst, and they have a big team of people working with them who are apprentices or assistants who are paid to help put together the works of art that they design and oversee. And so the ability to copy the style of the person you're working with so that when, for instance, if you're working with Rubens um, and you want to work in his studio, you have to be able to replicate his style so that a viewer would have trouble distinguishing his hand from yours in one of his paintings. And all the works that come out of the studio are going to be officially by Rubens, but depending on how much you pay, master might actually interact with the work and paint it himself uh, a relative percentage of 
the time. So, for example, famous artists would often paint faces and hands, which are considered the most difficult. They would design and supervise the work, but they would very be very unlikely to paint backgrounds, still lifes, architectural features. So it's a bit of a game for art historians to go through a museum and see works of art and try to determine how much of it the master actually painted. And that's all on the legal side of things. Oh, wow. And, and, and that's, uh, that's got to be because it was just a, a way to uh, be more productive, I'm guessing. Is that, is that accurate? It was a practicality yeah. thing? Yeah, it, 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 there are two sides, but one is that simply how you learn. You learn by copying the style of others, um, by imitation, and also for practical purposes, um, the person whose name is on the product is the famous artist or the master, and the people working for him have to be able to um, synthesize what they're doing so it still looks like the cohesive work of a master. And so uh, an example might be if you're building, um, I don't know, a house, and you have to work on the plans of the architect. And if you were to go and make the bedroom in a totally different style from the rest of the house, it wouldn't work well. And you're in the employ of the architect or the contractor, and your job is to make it match what their vision is. Okay. And okay. that's the way that the studio system worked for centuries. But even today, for example, people get all upset because they say, oh, Jeff Koons and Damien Hirst, who are the artists who have made more money than any other artist in history, they rarely ever actually touch the works that they are creating. They design and supervise them, but they aren't actually making them by hand. And people get very upset about this. But in fact, it's keeping with centuries old tradition of artist studios. So then what happens when the apprentice artist tries to go out on his or her own and make their own name, is that style going to greatly influence their own unique style? That's a, that's a super question, and the answer is absolutely. Um, that's sort of the, the legacy of artists in the traditional studio system. It would be it's a feather in your cap if your apprentices go out and are successful thanks to your training and have some element of your style that they bring with them. And there's famous examples in the history of art where the apprentices outdo the masters. Like there's a very famous sculptor who also painted named Andrea del Verrocchio, in 15th century Florence, and he painted um, a picture of John the Baptist baptizing Jesus, and there was one figure in the background that is much, much better than all the others, and that figure was painted by his apprentice, who was a young boy named Leonardo da Vinci. Oh. And the story is that when Verrocchio saw how much better this one figure in the painting was by his apprentice than his work, he said, I better stick to sculpture because my apprentice has already outdone me. Oh wow. wow! Wow! You know, th this weekend we watched uh, a film made in France, I guess, called a Amelie. Yes. And in Amelie, I don't know how old this movie is, but it had subtitles, so you had to read the whole thing. But but she's with there's a guy who's got bones of glass, so he has to be a painter, and he's copying. What's he copying? A Rembrandt or something? Yeah, uh, uh, Renoir. A Renoir. Yeah. It's uh, uh, it's called a uh, uh, luncheon on the boat. I think it was. Yeah. A few different people. And there was one girl yeah. drinking from a glass that he couldn't quite get, and I I don't know that I understood why he couldn't get her when he was so good with everything else, but don't know if it has anything to do with anything. It does. Has to do with the whole story. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the theme the theme of copying art. Now, the theme of copying art is that you find it everywhere. It pops up in pop culture all the time. And one of the things that I learned in the process of researching this book, which is an illustrated history of forgery, mostly to do with art, but also other aspects of cultural history, literature, political documents, even forging rare wine, there's a theme throughout that the forgers become these sort of folk heroes. And it's interesting the way the media depicts them, because they're really not hurting anybody in the traditional sense. There's one quote I have in there that art forgery is the friendliest way to commit economic fraud. <laughs> and the people in it, the people who are these forgers, are really larger-than-life characters. And they're the sort of people you read about and you actually kind of want to hang out with rather than recoiling in horror at these criminal, like, no goodness. So it's a, it's a wonderfully rich world to, to spend some time in, whether you're researching it or reading a book about it. But how do you make money with a forgery unless the original is missing like stolen like because if, i mean if i went to, if i were to make a forgery of the mona yeah. lisa and i told people this is the mona lisa no it's not it's still in the museum yes that is why it's a very bad idea 
to try to copy an existing work. That's what most people think of when they think of forgery, but it almost never happens in real life for the very basic reason that, you, that you've just figured out. It's a bad idea because especially in the internet era, in a minute or two, you can figure out where the original is. So most successful forgers do not copy existing works, but what they do is create a new work in the style of a famous artist that they try to pass off oh. as a work by that artist that has been lost. And you may or may not know this, this, this often surprises people. For most of the pre-modern artists, like all the big Renaissance names, we know about many more works that they created than actually survive today. In art history terms, there's something called lost, which is a work of art we simply don't know where it is. Um, it might have been destroyed, it might have been stolen, it might be missing, we might have simply missed later. And then there's extant, which is a term that means we do know where it is. And for many of the old masters, like Leonardo, uh, Raphael, Michelangelo, we know of much more than we actually can point our finger to, which means that for some of these artists, as much as two-thirds of all the works we know they created are lost. And the clever forgers try to create a work that matches the description of a known lost work by a famous artist. Well, don't they have a problem though with the with the um, uh, replicating the uh, paints themselves though because they're so their their manufacture is so different these days. Yeah, it's very difficult to do, and actually paints were not manufactured until the 19th century. You couldn't buy paint in tube. You had to buy pigment and grind it yourself and mix it with egg yolks as a binder, which would make it stick to the canvas. Oh, wow. And it's very complicated, and some of the best forgers take the time to mimic the chemical composition of paints. So what percentage of which pigments were ground together to match the purple used by Titian, these, these sort of levels of specificity. But one of the things I learned in researching this book is that level of detail is unnecessary to be a successful forger. Most of the forgers, and I look at over 60 in the book, were successful because of the confidence trick, the story behind the work, rather than the object itself, which if you looked at in a vacuum, you'd sort of think, wait a second, why would this fool anybody? Do you know what I don't really know? I don't really know what art is. Let me explain what I mean by that and why I think I don't know what it is. If I were to go to a museum and I were to see something by um, uh, Norman Rockwell, for example, I would say, gosh, this guy was really good. And somebody else will say, and I've heard this, no, yes. no, 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 he was a good illustrator, not a good artist. Yeah. And I was like, well, okay, yeah. well, well, I guess I don't know what art is. And, and then and then the, the museum will have a Charles Schultz display. Charles Schultz, the cartoonist. Yes. And there's Charlie Brown all over the place. <laughs> wow, this is a great artist. And, yeah. and, and, and you know, the same thing happened. We had the museum people in the studio one time. Mm -hmm. And just the day before, we had Peter Max on. You know, you know who Peter Max is? The Like the pop artist from the 60s or something? Mm -hmm. Thing. Anyway, okay, yeah. so I asked him, would, I asked the guy from the museum, would you ever have a Peter Max, you know, exhibit? Oh, gosh, no, not Peter Max. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what is it? I mean, what makes a painting art as opposed to just an illustration? I don't understand. I, I actually have two, two quick and concise answers for you because my students ask this question a lot. Um, for the purposes of, of, of what we study, art are objects created... Um, with the intent that they are works of art. So part of it is the intention of the creator. If it's like a shoe that is manufactured in a factory, the creator isn't trying to create something that, that has artistic value and is trying to be a piece of their soul in some sort of social commentary, it's just a shoe. But if you created a shoe and said, I'm creating this with the intention of it being art, then, um, then that's a different story. So part of it is the intention of the creator. The other part is it has to have a value that is predominantly non-intrinsic. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you buy um, a gold and uh, jewel necklace at Bulgari, and you break it apart into its component parts, the gold and the jewels, and you sell them separately, the value is roughly what the intact necklace is. But if that necklace was owned by Marilyn Monroe, all of a sudden its value is much, much higher for non-intrinsic reasons because of its cultural importance or historical importance or the story behind it. And that's what constitutes art. Then the flip side is how does art have value? People ask me this all the time. And there's a little shorthand equation that I could share. The value of art is perceived rarity 
And in most cases, it's a unique work of art. And if it's mass produced, it's much less valuable. So perceived rarity plus perceived demand, people wanting it, preferably millionaires wanting it and bidding against each other, plus perceived authenticity has to be what people think it is. And you probably caught that three times I mentioned the word perceived because it's all about perception. If everyone in the world thinks a painting is by Rembrandt, then its value is as if it's by Rembrandt, even if it isn't. It's a weird organism, the art world. How does the people that are hired to steal the masterworks how do they actually know that they're stealing from somebody's private collection, the original or a fake? That, that's an interesting <laughs> question. I also teach about the history of art theft, and it's a quite distinct category from art forgery. Um, one thing to, to point out is that almost never in real history has anyone ever commissioned the theft of a work of art. That's what we think of from films like Thomas Crown Affair or Ocean's 12 or To Catch a Thief. Um, but I only know of a few dozen examples in the history of art theft dating back thousands of years when that's actually the case. And there's around 50,000 reported art thefts per year, so it's a tiny number. But that said, if you're stealing a work of art, um, how do you know you're getting the original? A lot of the times they don't. There's no such thing as a professional art thief. Um, they're almost always members of an organized crime group who will steal anything you pay them to, um, and they know absolutely nothing about art, with very few exceptions. So they are just stealing objects that look of high value. And sometimes they get fooled, or they steal something that's actually of no value. Sometimes they steal something that's very valuable and they don't realize it, and sometimes the media actually helps add value to what they stole. Quick example, in 2008, there was a theft from a museum in Odessa in the Ukraine of what looked like a Caravaggio painting. And Caravaggio is hot stuff. It would be hugely valuable. And big news organizations, including the New York Times, had this big sexy headline, $100 million Caravaggio stolen. And in fact, what all of them missed is that art historians seem to agree that this is not a Caravaggio, it's a copy of a Caravaggio that's worth maybe 100,000 bucks. But everyone in the world read the newspapers, the New York Times, and saw that this was stolen, and the thieves had no idea what it was worth, but they pointed to the New York Times and said, ah, this is great, this is worth $100 million. In fact, it should have been worth $1,000. And so the media, not doing as much research as they should, put um, uh, essentially a check worth thousands of times more in the hands of criminals um, when the criminals really had no idea what they had on their hands. Wow. Wow, this is a fascinating is topic. Uh, the the book course. is called The Art of Forgery. Uh, it is written by our guest Noah Charney over mm -hmm. in Slovenia. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I think this is fascinating, just south of Vienna. Yeah, and and, and I'm just you know, there's so many things I've always wondered about art. Uh, who was the other guy? Who was the guy who has the museum down in uh, Tampa? Uh, the Dolly. Guy, the, Dolly. Salvador Dolly. Salvador Dolly. Is he considered a great artist? I mean, he was great to me. Oh, absolutely. He is a great artist, and he also features in my book because um, it, he, he's uh, got a chapter of his own because he's got a little bit of a debate about whether he actually created certain works that he signed his name to. So there's a couple funny stories. One of them is he was, he was a few pickles short of a sandwich, I believe is the, the technical term. He was <laughs> quite crazy, especially at the end of his life. Um, and uh, he also was infamous for not remembering things, and he experimented with drugs, and, and um, he, he wasn't all there. And there's a story that a forger uh, did um, an imitation of his style and found him in Paris sitting on a park bench and came up to him and said, Monsieur Dali, I, um, I bought this painting of yours, but I see you forgot to sign it. Um, would you mind signing it for me? And he looked at it and he said, ah, yes, I remember this is one of my finest works, and he signed it. And actually signed his authentic signature to a forgery because he thought he had done it. And then it really brings up the question, is it authentic or not, if, it, if he authenticated it himself. The story is wow. that at the end of his life, um, there's a lot of evidence that he stopped painting. And instead, one of his apprentices, a guy named Anthony Peachot, was actually producing all of the paintings that he signed and that sold as Dali for the end part of his life. And when that was revealed a few years back, people were outraged. But in fact, it's just part of the studio system. It's not all that unusual. It's just a problem if people are expecting 
Dali to do all of every painting, when in fact he had a system of, of assistants who would create much of his works, and the question is if they might have created all of them, and then he just signed them at the end of his life when his creative powers had dried up. So we've been mostly speaking about paintings, but this applies to sculptures and other things as well, right? Absolutely. It applies to all sorts of art, also artifacts. And I have a, a, a lot of my book is not dedicated to art. There are sections on political documents, um, forged literature, scientific specimens. There's even a chapter on forged rare wine, which you wouldn't necessarily think of, but there are bottles of wine that sell for $100,000. Um, and, you know, it's, it's ironic with wine because as soon as you drink it, it no longer has its value. So you're buying something that's drinkable with the idea that you could theoretically drink it, but if you do, it's like you're drinking away $100,000. And people buy wine and people also forge it. And there's a whole rich story of people making millions off of forging wine that is supposed to date back to the 18th century. Wow. So going going back to Ro- to Robin's question of in- integrity, in, in uh, uh, I guess, in yourself, you know, self-integrity, if you if you're learning to to paint exactly like Picasso or, or whoever, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, Rembrandt, don't you? It's like in the music world; they never want somebody who sounds like somebody else, even though so many of them sound the same. <laughs> so, right. It's, it's like, how do you? I mean, is, isn't that what you strive for? Don't you strive to be different and have a unique look? Yeah, it, there are two parts to it. One hand, you're supposed to emulate the master style when you're still a student learning, um, but then you do need to develop your own style. And actually, there's a term that we throw around to mean any great work of art. The term is masterpiece. But historically, it has a specific meaning. When you have been an apprentice, and people would usually be apprenticed from age 12 until 18 or so, when they finished the apprenticeship, they would create a single work that is done entirely themselves and in their own style, and that's called the masterpiece. And they would submit it to the local painters guild, which is kind of like a union of painters who would give them, if they decide that they're good enough, based on this masterpiece, they'd give them permission to open up their own studio and to become a master themselves and have assistants and apprentices and to be commissioned to do paintings. So the idea of this masterpiece actually has a specific in the history of art. And in that masterpiece, you needed to show that entirely on your own, you can do a great work of art and also that you have your own sort of style that might be influenced by your master, but is doing something that's new and distinctive. Can photography be, oh gosh, two, two photography questions. Can A, can photography be art in the first place? And therefore, mm-hmm. that can be easily forged because you just yeah. reproduce a photo. Or, or can a photograph of a painting that is maybe painted over or something, what, Thomas Kincaid, he would have all these prints. Yeah. And then other artists would paint yeah. over the print to make it look like a painting. Yeah, would he be considered? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, Thomas Kincaid's interesting because people get upset when they hear about his system, but that is almost quintessentially the studio system. He's got a deal where depending on how much you pay, he will paint all of or a portion of or none of the finished product. And if you want to pay a very small amount, then it's literally a print of one of his paintings that is touched up with a little bit of color by assistance. But if you actually want to buy an, an original painting, you pay the maximum amount and he designs and paints the whole thing. But that's crazy expensive. And what most people will do is um, pay a smaller amount where he's touching it up a little bit, but the majority is painted by someone else. And that is not very different from what you'd get in Rembrandt or Rubens' studio. Wow. But to answer your photography question, photography can absolutely be art. Um, and it has to do with that component, the definition we talked about earlier, where rarity is one of the key components to it being a work of art. But, you know, rarity doesn't mean it's unique. There are photographs, there are old prints that um, might be in a series of a hundred or a thousand, but it's a finite number. No, we have to to run. Uh, Thank you so much for being on the air. The book is called The Art of Forgery. Uh, um, Let's see, the, the website for the book, real quick. Uh, you could just go to www.noacharney.com and you'll be able to find it. Thanks okay, so much for excellent. having me, guys. Thank you, Noah. Fox News Radio, I'm Karen McHugh. Today, the Senate tries to take away federal funding of Planned Parenthood. The Republican-controlled Senate will take a procedural vote today on legislation to take taxpayer dollars away from Planned Parenthood. The move comes after undercover videos.